Now, all over Arabia, you probably noticed this trend going on in which many of the countries are like building these opulent metal skyscrapers and lavish neon lights and glass palaces. I mean, that's great and all, but sometimes you just want that dusty, mud brick, wooden vaulted marketplace with colorful jewels, rugs, and spices and incense. Well, you're in luck, because if you want a real, true, hardcore, traditional Arab setting, Oman does not disappoint. Ahem. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, it's just it, things are a little. We'll get to you later. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. If you don't know anything about Oman, basically it's like the loving grandma of the Arab world, who has some pretty crazy dark secrets in her past. Let's just say they had a sultan that made everything from sunglasses to speaking with someone for more than 15 minutes illegal. In any case, Oman is now very different from the early 20th century. Let's go over to grandma's house now, shall we? Nah, I'm not gonna do the oh man, it's Oman pun, that one's too easy. What I will do though, is get you in the learning zone. You know, relax, meditate, and like yoga, I'm gonna help you get your om on. <laughs> okay, seriously though, it's map time. Oman is located on the southeastern coast of the Arabian Peninsula of the Middle East. It sits right at the mouth of the Persian Gulf, bordered by three other countries. The country is divided into 11 governorates, with the capital and largest city of Muscat located in the northeast. It also holds the largest airport, Muscat International. Otherwise, the second largest city outside of the Muscat metropolitan area would be Salala, located in the complete opposite side of the country in the southwest, just about 50 miles or 80 kilometers from the border from Yemen. It also holds the second busiest airport, Salala International. Somewhere around 90% of the country lives in the northeastern areas, with about half alone just in the northeast coast by Muscat. The Al Wusta Governorate is the least sparsely populated area, with only about 50,000 people. The smallest and least populated governorate, though, would be the Musandam Governorate, which which is strange if you look at it because it's a completely detached exclave divided into two parts, the Musandam Peninsula and the exclave town of Mada, which in itself has a counter enclave of the United Arab Emirates inside of it. We'll explain more about this later. Essentially what it comes down to is this narrow corridor of sea known as the Strait of Hormuz at its narrowest, only about 21 nautical miles wide, is the most important section of economic activity amongst all the nation states surrounding it. Why? Because all imports and exports via shipping cargo must pass through through, and about a third of the world's liquefied natural gas and 20% of the world's total global oil production passes through here. Oman got a hold of the peninsula, and today, depending on your nation's diplomacy, you have to choose which territorial water jurisdiction you want to pass through to avoid trouble. This makes the corridor even narrower for some countries. Most cargo ships have the option to stop over in the port town of Hassab before moving on. This gives Oman quite the advantage when it comes to economic activity. Otherwise, the port of Sultan Qaboos is the largest port in Oman and one of the oldest in the world. Today the country does not have a rail system, but they are currently underway to build one with the rest of the GCC countries, connecting the entire eastern side of the peninsula starting in Kuwait and hopefully ending in Salalah. Now back to the enclave thing with the UAE. How did it happen that way? Well, long story short, in the 1930s there were four main clans that ruled the peninsula area and it kind of went like this. Okay guys, we need to figure out who we want to side with. Well, let's see, it's 1930, Oman is doing really good. I mean, they had a huge empire extending all the way to Africa. And they have such great resources like frankincense and date palms, their markets are so flourishing. Yeah, and look at the Emirates. What do they have? Just some cheap fishing ports? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's settled. We're sticking with Oman because they are totally cooler and have way better fiscal security. Uh, I'm from the town of Nawa and I have an allegiance to the Emirates. I, I can't go along with this. Fine, we'll build our territory around you, but don't come crying to us 50 years down the line when we get rich. I mean, we have the Strait of Hormuz. You're making a huge mistake. <laughs> Yeah, we just had an oil boom and Dubai just built the tallest building in the world, but hey, how's that Strait of Hormuz doing for you? Yeah, the Emirates kind of figured things out and got a makeover. Now, when it comes to Oman's civil layout, though, it's quite different from all the other Gulf states. Oman is often called the last bastion of unspoiled Arabia. Traditional architecture is heavily cherished and protected. For one, you'll notice that most buildings are white or beige. This is actually regulated by the government as it gives off a sense of harmony and cleanliness. Otherwise, the nation also has sovereignty over dozens of small islands and islets off the coast, most of which are uninhabited and empty, with the largest one being Masira Island. This is part of the Ash Sharkia region in the east, which holds the Royal Air Force of Oman, with 12 small villages on it. And further west, you have the Huria Muria Islands, part of the Dofar Governorate. These were actually at one point gifted to Queen Victoria from the Sultan of Muscat back in 1854, and at the time she was just like, eh, I'll just let the people in our India colony take care of it. Otherwise, some places of interest in case you decide to visit might include the National Museum, the Women's Only Souk on Wednesday, 
day, men are not allowed. The second largest cave chamber in the world, the Bima Sinkhole. There's over 500 forts and castles like these. The Muscat Corniche, the Royal Opera House, the Sultan Qaboos Grand Mosque, Al Alam Palace, the Tomb of Job, these ruins, and this place, the Bahla Village. It's like famous for black magic or something like that. All right, and with that being done and said, now we go to the next part of Oman, the Omani landscape. And be careful because you could find yourself in literal quicksand. Now, Oman is a Gulf country, which means it's gonna be pretty dry no matter where you go. But dry can come in all shapes and forms, and with Oman, things can get pretty colorful. First of all, the country lies on the Arabian plate that converges right into the Eurasian plate, meaning that the Musandam Peninsula may occasionally get some tremors. This is what gives the peninsula and islands their weird fjord-like shape with sharp inlets. Technically, the islands are sinking, eroded through the tectonic activity, which causes water to flood into the valleys. The majority of the population kind of lives in two of these ice coastal valleys shielded on all sides by the mountains. In the south, you have Salala, surrounded by the Dofar Mountains, and in the northeast, you have Muscat and various other towns in the Al Barina Plain, surrounded by the Al Hajar mountain chain, which, by the way, has the tallest peak, Jabal Shams, at over 3,000 meters. These hidden valleys are essentially the greenest and most lush parts of the country. Otherwise, much of the nation is covered in the Jidat Al Harasis Desert. Oman is one of 18 nations across the world with no permanent rivers. However, if you look at the country from above, you can see the long vast network of wadis, shallow ephemeral watercourses that have seasonal flows when rains come. The closest thing to a river would probably be Wadi Bani Khalid. This is the most famous one with small streams that lead to oasis towns. However, the streams don't connect all the way and leave pockets of pools on what should be a river path. In that regard, the largest inland body of water would probably be the Daika Dam Reservoir, which holds a small pocket of mountain spring runoff in the Hajar Range. Otherwise, see this dark section here? Yeah, be careful of this spot. It's called the Um Al Samim, or Mother of Poisons. This is a low-lying closed basin that collects all the brackish water from whatever precipitation and runoff the country gets, making it into one of the world's largest quicksand areas. Don't let the crusty surface fool you. Cars have been known to have gotten hopelessly stuck in these sands. Yeah, a quicksand spot. These deserts have a lot of tricks up their sleeves. All right, and now it's time for my triple shot of espresso break, which means uh, Noah comes in. Oh. Yeah, quite an entrance. Oman prides itself on its natural diversity and landscape. Other states in the Gulf don't exactly have what Oman has. For one, they are known for being the land of frankincense and myrrh. Today, however, petroleum products make up the largest export somewhere around 80%. The largest reserve being in the area by the town of Fahud. Less than 1% of the country is cultivated, which limits their agriculture output, even though they've been trying to diversify in the past few decades. As for wildlife, you can find many species meandering about the wilderness, such as obvious camels, sand gazelle, ibex, and over 500 species of birds. They're also one of the few places with a confirmed surviving population of Arabian leopards and chameleons, mostly in the South Dofar region. Anyway, moving on. Food! Some top dishes you guys, the Omani Jaga peeps suggest we mention include things like Camel Biryani, Makbus, Shua, Omani style Hawa, Haris, Mashui, Mukalab, Sakana. This eggplant dish. And much like everywhere in the Gulf, you will most likely be offered cardamom coffee with dates as a mini stack. Yep, you'll see this symbol of hospitality a lot, as well as some other interesting traits in their society. Which brings us to... Thank you, Noah. Now, in the Arab world, there are two countries that kind of act like the safe, neutral grandma and grandpa, Jordan and Oman. Oman is like the nice, happy grandma that everyone loves to visit. She feeds you, takes care of you, but unbeknownst to most people, she covers up a mysterious and somewhat dark backstory. First of all, the country is a fast-growing country, reaching close to about 5 million people, and nearly 45% of the entire population are expats from abroad. Only a little over half of the population actually identifies as Omani at around 55%, which classifies as Arab. The majority of the remaining population population is made up of expats from all over, mostly Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. The largest nations represented being India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, with smaller groups from places like Indonesia, the Philippines, and the Zanzibar Islands. They use the Omani Rial as their currency, they use the types C and G plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. For one, most Omanis have three identifying factors. Their tribe, their distinct Ibadi Islam faith, and for some people, their maritime merchant background. There are quite a few tribes broken down into clans and families, but the two largest ones are the Hinawi and Gafi. 
Kafiri. Both are general cousin tribes of the larger Bedouin people groups. Most people at around 85% of the country is Muslim, adhering to the Ibadi branch of Islam, which comes from the teachings of this guy. It is a sect of Islam unique, mostly to Oman, that most Muslims across the world don't even know too much about, but it claims to predate Sunni and Shia. Otherwise, the nation is classified as an absolute monarchy under the headship of Sultan Qaboos bin Said al Said, but it's like the Sultan is kind of cool and the people generally like him. I mean, his dad, the former Sultan, was kind of like a complete mess and he ruined the entire country. He supports things like the freedom of religion and even financed the construction of four Catholic and Protestant churches and several Hindu temples. And today he tries to lead like a neutral ground zone in the Middle East. He even met up with Netanyahu and often Oman acts as like the mediator between the Middle East and the West with Iran. Hmm, we should hang out sometime. Arabic is of course the official language, however, they are known for having their own distinct dialect. In addition, Oman is pretty much how this Swahili language came into existence. How so? Well, for nearly two centuries, they had a sizable empire that extended all the way from parts of what are now Iran, all the way down to the east coast of Africa into parts as far south as Mozambique. On a controversial side note, this empire was pretty much the leading movement behind the Arab slave trade that took place on the east side of Africa as the Atlantic slave trade was going on in the west. Not many people talk about it, but according to historical data, more slaves were actually transported on this side of Africa than on the west. In order to form a way of communicating with the vastly diverse Bantu and Cushitic people groups of East Africa, the Omani colonizers developed a sort of fusion between Arabic and Bantu languages called Swahili, which comes from the Arabic word of coasts. And today it is a lingua franca for a significant portion of the East African states like Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. This is why you might see some Africans living in Oman and Omanis living in Zanzibar. Otherwise, in the Gulf states, everyone can kind of like pinpoint an Omani. And here's Hannah with Culture Stuff. Omanis are known for a lot of things. For one, almost everybody in the Gulf will tell you generally Omanis dress a little different. Most men and women in places like the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and so on, they have your typical white thobe with kathia for men and black abayas for women. In Oman, you can still see those, but they also have the Omani dishdasha with a drawstring, as well as the Omani cap or kuma. Traditionally, women would wear a shorter dress over a pair of trousers called sirwa. On top of that, the unique looking batula nose covering can still be seen in certain groups. The one thing that definitely makes the Omani stick out clothing wise though is the hanjar, the traditional curved dagger of Oman, usually worn on a belt or sash for men used in ceremonies. This is a specific symbol unique to Oman, and it is even found on their flag. Otherwise, Oman was at one point one of the most important shipping and seafaring nations in the world, known for making some of the best traditional Dao boats that have been known to sail all the way to China in the 8th century. Dao racing is a popular sport as with camel and horse racing. And finally, here's Keith with his music segment that no one cares about. Music in Oman has always kind of stood out from the rest of their neighbors due to a bunch of historical factors. For one, thanks to the Omani Empire, there's a lot more African influence in certain genres like Liwa and Fana at Tambora. These were created by Bantu peoples brought over from the colonial times. Traditional instruments like the oud are commonly played, however, there is even a small emerging metal scene with Omani bands like Arabia and Belos. Thanks guys! Anyway, we gotta move on. History time! In the quickest way I can summarize it, Portuguese occupation, Ottoman Empire, current dynasty with the Al Said family starting, Omani Empire to the east coast of Africa, Arab slave trade, Treaty of Sib, Jabal Akhtar War, Gwadar sold to Pakistan, Dofar rebellions, 1970 bloodless coup, current Sultan revamps the whole country, and here we are today. Some famous people you guys, the Omani geography people suggested we mention, include people like the current Sultan Qaboos bin Said, Moshin Haider Darwish, Saud and Sahel Bawan, Mohammed Barwani, Fatima Al Nabhani, Mohammed Al Habsi, Butaina Al Raisi, Ahmed Al Harti. Oh, and Isla Fisher was actually born here. And some historical figures might include all these people. I'll just do a photo montage because I can't pronounce all of them. And supposedly Sinbad the Sailor was born here. Well, that just about does it. The mediators of the Gulf. And let's find out how the diplomatic approach to things gets them on a global scale now, shall we? <laughs> Being Oman means being a Gulf state, but it also means being a bridge state that kind of links the Gulf to the outside in many ways. First of all, they are generally close with Jordan. If Oman is the grandma, Jordan is kind of like the grandpa. They sort of play the same role in Middle Eastern conflict by mediating and so on, which would eventually unite the nation. For the UK, they are personal friends, at least the monarchs are. In 1798, they signed a treaty of friendship, and in 1891, they became a British protectorate. The British also played a role in stopping the rebellions in Zanzibar 
Zanzibar, and today the Queen and Sultan have done many unofficial trips to visit each other and maintain the ties. Surprisingly, Iran and Israel too. Oman is one of the only few nations in the Arab world that has had government officials visit each other to maintain stability and trade. Two prime ministers of Israel have visited themselves, and Omani Foreign Minister Yusuf Ibn Alawi visited Jerusalem. They signed an agreement on trade in 1996, and the same foreign minister is quoted for saying, maybe it is time for Israel to be treated the same as other states, and also bear the same obligations. Arabs must take initiatives to make Israel overcome fears for its future in the region, which of course was a controversial statement. With Iran, Oman is definitely the mediator between the Middle East that bridges the Sunni and Shia divide, as well as the West and Iran divide. They have had ties that predate the Islamic Revolution in 1979, all the way back to the Pahlavi dynasty in the 20s. As co-owners of the Strait of Hormuz, they share a lot of history. A noticeable minority of people in Oman are Baluchi, originating in Iran, and the Sultan even visited himself in 2009 to discuss a number of political topics. Today, Oman is one of the few Arab nations that Iran can trust, which makes relations to the rest of the GCC countries a little more complicated. On paper, of course, they are close friends, and in every sense, they work together normally and comfortably. The UAE and Saudi Arabia, though, are kind of like the annoying brothers that poke fun of them and play pranks that cross the boundaries, but Oman is just very non-confrontational, so they just kind of take it because family is family. This, however, in return has kind of led to them making friends with outlier nations like Yemen, Qatar, and Iran. They are the only Gulf nation to have open relations with each, and they agreed with Iran's nuclear deal, which makes Saudi Arabia and the UAE think a little harder before they play the pranks from now on. Nonetheless, it's kind of interesting because a lot of Omanis have told me that the Zanzibar Islands might actually be considered their best friend. Zanzibar is like the little adoptive child that Oman held close to for the longest time, and many Omanis and Zanzibaris share family, culture, and history. Today, you can see many Zanzibaris and Omanis living in each other's areas as a representation that they at one time were very closely linked. In conclusion, every region in the world has an Oman, an old, ancient, wise, traditional grandma that is one of the only few keys to maintaining some order. It's not an easy task, but someone has to do it. Stay tuned, Pakistan is coming up next.